Okay. Here we are. Chemistry 102, Chapter 15, 16, and 17 review questions for this summer. So let's start with the first question about Chapter 15. And remember that Chapter 15 covers amines, amines and amides are kind of the main focus of that chapter. So we start out with um, Socrates used conine, an alkaloid, and remember that um, an alkaloid is a natural natural compound, so something isolated from a plant or an animal, a natural compound containing containing a nitrogen atom, um, extracted from the poison hemlock plant, so you can see that it's clearly a natural compound, uh, use that to commit suicide. How is this nitrogen containing compound best classified? A cyclic amide, well it's definitely not an amide because an amide in order to have an amide, you'd have to have a carbonyl group, right? And there's no oxygen in here. I'll just draw a primary amide. It says primary aromatic amine. Well, it's not aromatic because aromatic, aromatic, we would have to have a six-membered ring, but we would have double bonds that alternate. A secondary heterocyclic amine. I think that this looks like the best answer because this is definitely a secondary amine. And it's in a heterocycle, right? We have a cyclic, uh, or we have a ring, and then we have a nitrogen or a hetero atom in there. The next one says tertiary amine. It can't be that, and I'm not going to go through every wrong answer tonight, but it can't be a tertiary amine because a tertiary amine is when you have three R groups attached to your nitrogen, and we clearly have a hydrogen attached to it. The next one is a lactam. We don't even talk about lactams in this class, but a lactam, just so you know, is when you have a cyclic amide. So a lactam looks looks like this. So this would be an example of a lactam. Again, it's something we, we don't even talk about in this class. Question number two says, for amino butanoic acid, which has the common name GABA, which stands for gamma amino butyric acid, is a neurotransmitter found in the brain's nerve cells. Which of the following properly represents the structure of this compound? I think the best thing to do would be to just draw this structure for amino butanoic acid. So if I start by drawing butanoic acid, I would have one, two, three, four carbons, and I could even number those one, two, three, four, like that, if that would help me out. And it says that I have a four amino group. So that means that on the fourth carbon, I'm going to put an amino group out there, and that would give me four amino butanoic acid. And if you look at all of these answers, you can see that B has one, two, three, four carbons, and then we have our amino group. And so the correct answer would be B. Let me just point out something about the name GABA. So GABA, GABA stands for gamma. So we have alpha, beta, gamma, yeah, gamma, amino, amino, butyric, butyric acid. Okay, and if you think about the structure of butyric acid, it's the same as butanoic acid, but butyric acid is the common name, right? Here we would have the alpha carbon, this would be the beta carbon, and then this would be the gamma. So if we have an amino group on the gamma, there you go, that's where the name GABA comes from. You can see that organic chemists do love to use common names for molecules. So don't ever think, oh, I'm learning these for nothing, nobody uses them, oh, we use them all the time. With that in mind, let's take a look at number three. It says, what type of product results from a neutralization reaction between an alkylamine and an acid such as HCl? Remember that a neutralization is, is an acid plus a base. And what do we get when we react an acid and a base? I told you this last class, we get a salt plus water. And remember that amines, right? Amines, amines are what? They are bases. Okay, they're weak bases, but they're still bases. So if I take an alkylamine and an acid like hydrochloric acid, who can tell me what the answer for this one would be? Now I'll open up my chat so I can see what everybody's writing in here. Who could help me out? Anybody have an idea for number three? I have an 
I just wrote down a tertiary meme. Thanks, Tyler. Tyler and Jade both said C. Okay, let's see. Let's see if they are correct. <laughs> Anyhow, so they say an alkyl ammonium salt seems pretty reasonable to me. If we take a base plus an acid, we end up with a salt, but we end up with an alkyl what? An alkyl ammonium salt. So we end up adding a proton to this nitrogen here from our amine, and that's going to have a positive charge. And then we're left over with the chloride ion. Okay, and we call this, we call this ion right here, we call this an alkyl, an alkyl ammonium, ammonium, ammonium salt. Okay, so that's an alkyl ammonium salt. All right, there we go. Um, so let's see here. It says, what compound is pr produced by the reduction of the amide shown below? Well, first, let's start by redrawing the amide. I'll draw the bond line structure just to be cheeky here. So we'll put NH. There we go. And if I reduce this, you remember that we take an amide. Oops, not oxidation. We're going to reduce it. So we write our reducing agent as just a hydrogen atom inside square brackets. And that represents some kind of reducing agent. And who could tell me what would be the best, what would be the best uh, answer for this one? I'm sure somebody looked or somebody has been studying and has an idea. Okay, so B, all right. So somebody says ethyl methyl amine. All right, let's take a look at what it would be. So basically what we'd end up doing is we would basically remove the carbonyl. So let's remove the oxygen from the carbonyl and then we would have our nitrogen and our hydrogen like this. So this is the amine that we would get. On the left-hand side, the way I have it written, we have an ethyl and on this side we have a methyl. So this would be ethyl methyl amine because we want to list, or sorry, did I write ethyl? Mr. Dion needs another coffee, I think, because I meant propyl. <laughs> there we go, because we have, we have one, two, three carbons, okay? So methyl propylamine, sorry, would be the correct answer. So the correct answer for this one would be C. What you have to remember is that when you reduce an amide, you end up removing the oxygen from the carbonyl group. That's what happens in the reduction of an amide. All right, let's move on. Number five says, which of the statements concerning the compound below is incorrect? The first one, it says, it is a tertiary amine. That doesn't seem reasonable to me. Could anybody tell me what kind of amine we're looking at here? Yeah, thanks, Tyler. Yeah, this is a primary amine, right? This is a primary, a primary amine. So the answer is we're looking for something that's incorrect. So the answer is it's a tertiary amine. This is not a tertiary amine. Okay. This molecular formula is correct. Its name would be 2-methyl-2-pentanamine because if we look at the longest carbon chain, we have one, two, three, four, five. So we have a 2-methyl-2-pentanamine. Um, it is able to form intermolecular hydrogen bonds. Yes. Yes, because it has nitrogen-hydrogen bonds in it. And it can act as a base. Right? Amines are bases. So there we go. All right. So the answer is A. It is a tertiary amine is incorrect. I'm a little wacky here in my numbering system, but anyhow, we'll just move on to the next question. It says, which of the following is not a neurotransmitter in the human body? And I went into some detail about this in my videos, and we talked about this briefly, I think, in the lecture. But we have serotonin, acetylcholine, histamine, aspartame, and epinephrine. Hopefully there's one of these that kind of rings a bell and says, that doesn't sound like a neurotransmitter to me because aspartame is found in things like sugar-free gum and diet cola and all, all manner of diet, you know, diet drinks, really. So aspartame is actually a sweetener, okay, that is made from two amino acids and it is not a neurotransmitter. So we'll put here, it is a sweetener, a sweetener made from amino acids, amino acids. All right, let's move on from there. The next question says the active ingredient in insect repellent, and if you look at the 
back of a bottle of, you know, um, insect repellent, you always see something about DEET content. It says the active ingredient in the insect repellent DEET is the amide formed by the reaction shown below. What is the structure of DEET? And you can see that what we're doing is a reaction that I went over in detail um, that involves a reaction between an acid an acid chloride or an acyl chloride, whatever you want to call it. We have our acid chloride right here, and we're reacting it with a, um, with a secondary amine. With a secondary amine. And notice what I went over in class quite a bit is that we need two molecules of the amine. And the reason why is because you need one to react, and you need the second molecule of the amine to behave as a base and to remove a proton from the intermediate that's formed. If I, you know, since we have an exam in 48 hours, let's just cut to the chase, and we're gonna end up breaking this carbon chlorine bond here, and then we're gonna form a bond to the nitrogen. So if we draw out what we would have, let's take a look at that. Let's put in our aromatic ring and our methyl group. Then we're gonna have a carbonyl. We will need that to form our new functional group, which is going to be an amide, and then we're going to have a nitrogen. And what would be attached to that nitrogen? We have one, two ethyl groups. So I'm going to draw those in as bond line structures like this and put in my lone pairs just to be, you know, just to have a really nice structure. And if you look at all of these, so you can see A is this compound, B is this one, C is this one, D is this one, so on and so forth. And the one that matches this would be, would be B. All right, did anybody get that one? Because I went over that question a few times, or I went over that a little bit in class, I thought. I just want to make sure that somebody got that. An important reaction between an acid chloride and an amine. Just give me a thumbs up if you got it. Okay, well, with that in mind, let's keep moving to question number seven. It says, what is the product formed when the amide below is hydrolyzed by a strong base? So a strong base is, in this case, they're using sodium hydroxide, is a strong, a strong base. And I'm going to be breaking this bond right here in my amide. Now, remember, when we hydrolyze esters and amides in acid, we end up with a carboxylic acid. But if we hydrolyze an ester or an amide and base, we are not going to end up with a carboxylic acid. We are going to end up with a carboxylate, right? We end up with a carboxylate, which looks something like this. So we would end up with that. Of course, sodium would be the cation in this case. And then we're also going to be left over with the amine. So I have a nitrogen, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four carbons. And then I'm going to have two hydrogens attached to it like that. So I end up with a carboxylate salt and an amine. And if you look at all the answers here, A is something that couldn't even exist in reality, okay? B is something really wacky. Um, C, it actually looks like one of the products that I drew, right? This, this product that I drew here is actually C, okay? Which is, which is the correct answer. D is propionic acid, right? And if we're doing a reaction, if, if reaction is in strong base, okay, um, acid, I'll put here carboxylic acid, carboxylic acid will not be produced. We would end up with a carboxylate. Okay, so we end up with this, which is a, oops, a carboxylate. All right, and then what's E? It's probably something even more wacky, and it is, okay. Okay, let's move on to question number eight. It says, what class of biological compounds contains amide bonds as a part of their central feature? Who could tell me that? Which one of these biological compounds contains amide bonds as a part or as a central feature, sorry, in their structure. Yeah, absolutely. It's peptide bonds. Okay. 
um, peptide bonds, um, or sorry, C. Yeah, you said C peptide bonds, which is C, which is proteins. Okay, so proteins are actually all held together by peptide bonds. We're going to talk about this in a lot more detail later on in this class, but amino acids are nothing more than a bunch of peptide bonds in a row like this. So we just have peptide bond after peptide bond after peptide bond. Um, what's the physical state of most amides at room temperature? Who can tell me the answer to that one? It's something that's mentioned in one of the slides kind of briefly, but it does go over it. Yeah, most amides are solids at room temperature, as a matter of fact. So we'll put that amides are solids at room temperature. Okay, move on from there. What is the common name of the compound shown below? Well, remember that our book says that you can always look at or think about the analogous carboxylic acid. And if I have a one carbon carboxylic acid, this is called formic, formic acid. And when I have a one carbon amide, so if I have a one carbon amide like this, what I would do is I remove, um, I end up removing acid or ic acid, ic acid, and I replace it with amide. And so what I would end up with for this compound would be formamide. Okay, and that's the name of the compound, which is formamide. There is another name in here that is the correct name for the compound, and that is methanamide, right? I would go from methanamide to ethanamide, so on and so forth. But methanamide, this is not common. This is IUPAC. Okay, that's the IUPAC name. And they're asking us specifically for the common names. So you need to know formamide, acetamide, propionamide, butyramide, and valeramide, the common names for the first five primary amides. Um, number 11 says, what's the IUPAC? name of the following compound. It's an amide, and you can see that all of the compounds end in amide, so we can't, you know, <laughs> eliminate any of them that quickly. But we could start by numbering the longest carbon chain with our eight from our amide. So we start with one, two, three, four. So this must be some kind of, if it's IUPAC, it must be some kind of butanamide. You look at the first one, it's propanamide. It can't be that. The next one is ethanamide. The next one says butylamine. There's no such thing, okay? It would, it's, it would have to end with amide. I didn't even notice that until now. Um, the next one says butanamide. So that one's a possibility. And then this one, n ethyl butyramide there's nothing wrong with that name, but this is a common, a common name for that compound. And so the best answer will be N-ethyl, right? Because I have an N-ethyl group. And so this compound is... Um, N ethyl butanamide because I'm looking for an IUPAC name. And so that is, that's the correct answer right there. Let's move on to number 12. It says acid catalyzed hydrolysis of amides is an important reaction because it represents the first step in the digestion of dietary protein. Okay, so the first step in the digestion of dietary protein. All right, so I'm going to do an acid catalyzed hydrolysis of this compound. Now it says, which of the following compounds is formed as a result of the acid catalyzed hydrolysis of N-methyl butanamide? Now notice that we have an amide bond and we're gonna break this bond, right? That's the amide bond. But we're doing our hydrolysis in acid. And so when we hydrolyze it, we're gonna get a carboxylic acid and the carboxylic acid is gonna come from this part of our molecule so we can even write that out. I'll even do it backwards just to kind of help us follow along the way that they've written. I'll even write out all the atoms. Okay, so we're going to end up with this carboxylic acid, one, two, three, four, which is butan, butanoic acid. And then I'm going to end up with an amine that comes from this part right here. And I could even start writing that down. I'm going to have a CH3, then a nitrogen with a hydrogen. What am I missing here, right? If I'm doing this reaction in, if I'm in acid, I'm going to end up with what? Who can help me? Uh, 
if I'm hydrolyzing an amide in acid, I end up with a carboxylic acid and what? Because there's no carboxylic acids in the answer. An alkyl ammonium ion. Thanks, Tyler. And so I'm going to have to add, what? One, two hydrogens. Okay, I'm going to end up with my alkyl ammonium. Okay, my alkyl ammonium ion. All right, there we go. And that is this one right here. Methyl ammonium. Okay, let's take a look at the true and false. So true or false, these are pretty quick. Number 13, amines behave as bases when dissolved in water. Would that be true or false? Do amines behave as bases? Yeah, absolutely. Amines are bases, okay? Are bases. Bases. So, yes, they're going to behave like bases. Um, number 14, hydrolysis of an amine produces an amide. That's false, right? That is absolutely false because you can't hydrolyze an amine. You would hydrolyze an amide and you could produce an amine from that, right? We would take an amide like this, okay, a tertiary amide, let's say, and we would hydrolyze that. Okay, we don't hydrolyze amines. You can even write here, hydrolyze. And you could hydrolyze it in acid or base. Um, the last one, number 15, says a primary amide has two carbons bonded to the nitrogen. Is that true or false? A primary amide. Yeah, it's false, okay? This is a primary amide, which only has one carbon bound to the nitrogen, this one here. Then I have a secondary amide, okay? A secondary amide has one, two carbons, and then a tertiary amide, tertiary amide has one, two, three carbons bound to the nitrogen like that, okay? So this one, number 15, would be false. False. Boom. Okay, let's move on to chapter 16, which deals with carbohydrates. The carbohydrates chapter. Question number one says monosaccharides are structurally structurally <laughs> defined as which of the following? Polyhydroxy aldehydes or polyhydroxy ketones, hemiacetals and acetals, polyamides or polyesters or enols, enolates, carboxylic acids. What's the best answer here? What would be the best answer for number one? Okay, well, I'd say that a monosaccharide isn't a polyamide, and a monosaccharide wouldn't structurally be defined as an enol or a carboxylic acid. But where I would say it might boil down to would be hemiacetals and acetals or polyhydroxy aldehydes and ketones. But keep in mind that there is an open chain form of every, of every um, aldose, let's say. So let's say we were talking about, you know, a keto or sorry, an aldohexose, like I'm drawing here. Oops, like I'm drawing here. Okay, this is not a hemiacetal or an acetal, but it is a polyhydroxy aldehyde, right? So I would say the polyhydroxy, oops, polyhydroxy aldehyde and ketone, right? These are all, these are, these are hydroxy groups. 
Okay, and then this is an aldehyde. All right, so polyhydroxy um, aldehydes or polyhydroxy ketones. Okay, let's try number two. It says carbohydrates are chiral or handed biomolecules. What does the term chiral describe? Who could tell me what the best answer for what does chiral describe? What would the best answer be? Yeah, I agree with that. Somebody said C, a molecule that exists in two non-superimposable mirror image forms. Absolutely, that's the definition of a chiral compound, is something that's non-superimposable upon its mirror image. And we went over some examples of that. We looked at some molecules that were chiral. We talked about you know human hands being chiral. Okay, let's take a look at number three. It says prop propran propranol is a chiral compound that exists as a pair of enantiomers. One enantiomer is used to treat irregular heartbeats and the other is used as a contraceptive. Which of the labeled carbon atoms are chiral? Who could help me out with this one? Which, which one of these are chiral? Yeah, somebody said it's C. So remember chiral, Chiral means four different different groups groups attached. Okay, well let's look at carbon three, which is the one Tyler recommended. Okay, there's carbon number three. Is it attached to four groups, four different groups? I say yes. It's attached to this hydrogen. Okay, it's also attached to this hydroxyl group over here. It's attached to this big old group over here. That's different than a hydrogen and a hydroxyl. And it's also attached to this group over here. Those four groups are all different. All different groups. Okay. Now, if somebody, in case somebody guessed um, E, what's the problem with C1? C1, we'll put C1 not chiral. Okay because it has two CH3 groups attached. And CH3 groups are identical to each other. Okay, let's move on and talk about alpha and beta D-glucose. It says, how does the structure of alpha D-glucose differ from that of beta D-glucose? There's a lot of reading in this one in the answers, so I'll leave it up to you guys. Can somebody tell me which one of these would be the best answer? I'm sure you've read them all five, six, seven, ten times. Somebody said C, an alpha D-glucose, the hydroxyl group on the hemiacetal, is below the ring, and in beta D-glucose, the hydroxyl group on the hemiacetal is above the ring. I would say that's absolutely correct here. I'm drawing a, a chair when I should just draw a Hayworth projection, right? So if I fill out my hydroxyls, oops, my hydroxyls, so we can always start with this, okay? Bring it down, up, down, like this, but it says in alpha D glucose, the hydroxyl is pointing down, and that is correct. So this would be the alpha position. This would be alpha D glucose, D glucose, okay? And if the hydroxyl is pointing up, okay? Um, if this is pointing up, then that would be beta D glucose, okay? There we go. So what is a reducing sugar? What's the best definition in number five of what is a reducing sugar? It says, a carbohydrate that can be um, oxidized by the Benedict's reagent, okay? A sugar that contains an acetal, a carbohydrate that can be reduced by Benedict's agent, and a sugar that can be digested by the body, a carbohydrate that is part of a polysaccharide. What's the best, um, the best answer here?
I would say the best answer is A, because a reducing sugar is a sugar that reduces, that reduces copper two to copper one, because copper two is blue and copper one is red, right? It reduces copper two, and in the process, the sugar gets oxidized, right? If this is reduction, okay, then the sugar gets oxidized at the same time. So the answer would be A. In fact, we can take another look at that reaction because it's so important, okay? It says, what test can be used to distinguish between a reducing sugar and a non-reducing sugar? So let's say we have an aldose, and aldoses have an aldehyde group, so we could just write, you know, it could be an aldose, it could be glucose, it could be tallose, whatever. It could be all manner of sugars. But anyhow, let's say we have an aldose plus copper 2. So I'll draw it in blue. So if we react with copper 2, which is blue, okay, what do we do? We end up oxidizing. We end up oxidizing to a carboxylate. And in the process, we form copper 1, which is red, right? So we have oxidation occurring this is oxidation and at the same time we have reduction reduction okay so reduction you can't have one without the other and so um what test can be used to distinguish a reducing sugar from a non-reducing sugar which one would these would be the test that has copper two ions being converted into copper copper one um yes it's the benedict's test absolutely benedict's test OK, and we can even write that up here. This basically is, you know, a shorthand version of what the Benedict's test is. OK, let's look at number seven. It says what disaccharide is composed of two glucose molecules joined together. The only way to really do this is to memorize it. I'd say that's the best way to memorize it uh, or best way to do it would be to memorize it. Sorry. Anyhow, who could tell me which one of these is two made up of two glucose units? Which one of these? Is, yeah, thanks, Jasmine. So maltose is the correct answer. Okay, lactose. Lactose is made from glucose and galactose. All right, and sucrose is made from glucose, glucose and fructose. And if you're wondering, do I have to know this for the exam? Yes. Um, cellulose is a polysaccharide made up of beta um, D glucose, which or Yes, D-glucose, de which is beta-1,4 linked. Okay, so it's a polysaccharide. It's not a disaccharide. So we can put here not a disaccharide. Okay, and galactose is not a disaccharide. Galactose is actually a monosaccharide. Monosaccharide. All right, there we go. So the answer is maltose. Thanks, Jasmine. Good. Okay, starch. Starch is composed of which two polysaccharides? Who could tell me the answer to this one? What's the best answer for starch is composed of which two polysaccharides? All right, the answer is amylose and amylopectin are the two polysaccharides that starch is made from. Number nine says, why are humans not able to digest cellulose? It says, humans um, lack the enzyme cellulase, which is required to hydrolyze the alpha-1,4 glycosidic bonds present in cellulose. B is the exact same thing. It says, humans lack the enzyme cellulase, which is required to hydrolyze the beta-1,4 glycosidic bonds in cellulose. That's the difference between amylose and cellulose. 
right? Amylos, amylos from the previous question is made up of alpha one four, alpha one four glycosidic bonds. Okay, whereas cellulose is made up of beta one four glycosidic bonds. And so this is in fact the correct answer is cellulose, sorry. Cellulose has beta one four glycosidic bonds. And so the correct answer here is B. All right, lactase and C, lactase has nothing to do with cellulose digestion. It is involved in lactose um, uh, digestion. Cellulose is not naturally available to humans. Well, that's not true. Whenever you eat a fruit, the fiber in it comes from cellulose because we can't digest fiber. And none of the above humans can actually readily digest cellulose. Would be nice. It could go graze on the front lawn. Um, anyhow, number 10 says, which property of D and L glyceraldehyde differ? Who could tell me that? What's the difference between D and L glyceraldehyde? Let's see. Tyler says C. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's going to be the direction which they rotate plain polarized light. And I went over that with you guys a little bit. You have, you know, your light source. Okay, you have a light source. And we said that light comes out going in all directions. And then you put that light or you shine that light rather through a polarizing filter so that you only end up with, you know, the light going in one direction like that. And then you put that light, you shine it through a tube with your sample in it. So your sample is in here. So we could put here sample. And then the sample is going to rotate the plane with the light to one direction or another like that. OK. Um, oops. It's going to rotate it in one direction or another. And that's called our optical our optical rotation. And we actually have to use plane polarized light to help us differentiate between enantiomers. In fact, DNL glyceraldehyde are enantiomers, enantiomers, right? They are non-superimposable, superimposable okay. mirror images, mirror images. We can have molecules that are not superimposable, but they, they don't have to be mirror images of each other, but enantiomers are non-superimposable mirror images. Okay, so it's the way that they rotate plane polarized light. In fact, before I move on, I should point out that D and L glyceraldehyde will have the same melting point, solubility, and density. Okay, their physical properties will be the same, but the direction in which they rotate, in which they rotate plane polarized light will differ. Number 11 deals with Fisher projections of these two monosaccharides shown here. I won't go into a great detail about this because it's mentioned in the book, but I didn't really go over it in my video. And that is um, the relationship between these two molecules. So when we have two molecules, I'll put here, um, molecules, molecules that are stereoisomers, stereoisomers, but, okay, that are stereo, but are not, are not enantiomers, are called diastereomers. So you can see that these two compounds have the same, the hydroxyls pointing in the same direction here. Here it's different, and then it's the same in these two here. Okay, so some of the stereocenters are the same, but one of them is different in the two. And so these are not mirror images of each other. You can clearly see that they are not mirror images across this plane that I've drawn here in red. So since they are not enantiomers, but they are, they are um, stereoisomers, the definition is that they would be considered diastereomers of each other. Okay, let's move on and try drawing the Haworth projection of alpha D idos. There's a few ways that you can do this. I went over it in my slides and, or sorry, in my videos rather, in quite a bit of detail. I went over the whole method of tilting, you know, knocking the, the sugar over and then drawing it. I think the easiest way to do it might be the Dr. Denniston way, or I'll say the fastest way to learn it. So what you have to memorize is whenever you're asked to draw a Hayworth projection, you always start by drawing a hexagon that has an oxygen in the top right corner. 
okay? And then you put in a CH2OH next door to the left of it. That's all you have to remember. After that, you can number the carbons one, two, three, four, five, and six. You could number these carbons one, two, three, four, five, six. It tells us in the name that we want to draw alpha D idos. That tells us that our hydroxyl, okay, OH at C1 is down, right? Because it's alpha. So at carbon one, we're going to draw that pointing down. And remember, carbon one, this is not a chiral carbon, but carbon one in the uh, Haworth projection is a chiral carbon. So then all we have to do is we need to figure out which direction is the hydroxyl pointing on carbons two, three, and four. And the quick way I told you to do that is that anything that's on the right-hand side, oops, anything that's on the right-hand side for carbons two, three, and four, all of these substituents will be pointing down. So since I have a hydrogen at carbon two pointing down, that means the hydroxyl shown here is going to be pointing up like that. Since I have a hydroxyl pointing down on carbon three, I'll draw in the hydroxyl. And then since I have a hydrogen pointing down on carbon four, the hydroxyl here must be going up like this. And so this would be the Hayworth projection. If you really want to make it beautiful, you could try shading it in the way it's done in the book like this to show that it's being viewed on an angle like this. And if you're wondering, you know, what about, what about carbon five? How come I'm not worried about that carbon? Because this hydroxyl right here, okay, let me highlight it in yellow. This, this oxygen is this oxygen right here, okay? It's the one that's involved in this hemiacetal bond, okay? And just to, re, re, just to go over it one more time, where, how, do, how do we decide that it's alpha? That is decided right here. This is the alpha position for the anomeric carbon, okay? The hydroxyl on the anomeric carbon. The next one's kind of an interesting question. Um, it says, uh, draw the structure of the disaccharide formed when two d talos molecules are joined by an alpha 1,4 glycosidic linkage. Let me show you how to do this. The first thing that we'll do is we'll start by drawing the Hayworth projection of alpha d talos. Okay, oops. Didn't mean to do that. Let's go back to where we were. Boop, 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 boop. Okay, so first we're going to start by drawing alpha Talos. So what did I show you in the last problem? I said we're going to start by drawing our six-membered ring with our oxygen in the top corner like that. We're going to have our CH2OH up here. All sugars are going to start with that. You can number the carbons, one, two, three, four, five, and six. You can number these ones, one, two, three, four, five, and six. Since it's alpha detalos, that tells us that the hydroxyl at carbon one is going to be pointing down. Now we're concerned with carbons two, three, and four. Where are the hydroxyls pointing there? Well, you can see here that all of the hydrogens are on the right-hand side. That means that all of those hydrogens are pointing down, which would mean that all of the hydroxyl here must be pointing up, right? The opposite of down is up. So that means that my hydroxyl at carbon two is pointing up, at carbon three is pointing up, and at carbon four is pointing up like that, okay? Now I can shade it in to make it look really beautiful like this. But what it's asking me, it's asking me to draw what happens when I have, when I make a disaccharide from two of these molecules. So I want to take two of these and I'm going to join them by a 1,4 alpha glycosidic linkage. So what am I going to have to do? I'm going to have to take two of these molecules and link them by an alpha 1,4. What does the alpha mean? The alpha means in the glycosidic bond, right, the glycosidic bond off of carbon one is going to be going down, and it's going to be between the anomeric carbon, carbon one, and carbon four on an adjacent or the next molecule of alpha d talos. So let's draw in a molecule of alpha d talos. I'm just copying what I wrote, okay? I'm going to put my hydroxyl going up, this one going up, this one going up. I'm moving a little faster here, so it's not quite as pretty as it was. Now I want to draw my glycosidic linkage, okay? So I'm going to have alpha like that. It's going to be going down. I drew it as a, at a, on a bit of an angle just for room, okay? And then it's going to be linked to carbon-4 of another D 
detalose molecule. Here's carbon four, right? So I'm gonna draw another detalose molecule and it's gonna be attached at carbon four. There we go, like that. Okay, with my CH2OH. Okay, I'm gonna put my alpha down here like this. One, two, like this. So this is my alpha 1,4 glycosidic linkage. I know I've written it kind of funny here. It says 1,4 alpha, but you get it's the same thing. So alpha 1,4, right? Alpha, because this is pointing down. In 1,4, let me help out even more. Okay. The 1,4 comes from carbon 1 and carbon 4 like that. And that's our disaccharide formed from two molecules of alpha detalose linked together with a 1,4 alpha or an alpha 1,4, same thing, glycosidic bond. All right. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. Let's keep moving. And let's finish up with chapter 17, which is the lipids chapter. I hope you all watched the videos that I worked very hard to make about section 17.4, I think, until the end. Um, which one of these is, oops, yeah. Which one of these is not classified as a type of eicosanoid? Who could help me with that? Which one of these is not classified as an eicosanoid? An eicosanoid is a naturally occurring co compound that has 20, 20 carbons. You probably would have had to have read the book. Yeah. Yeah, because, thanks, Tyler, because... We know that prostaglandins, thromboxane, and leukotrienes, those are all are eicosanoids. Okay, so the answer is actually steroids. Steroids are not an eicosanoid. So, mm -hmm. not an eicosanoid. All right. Um, this next one is kind of a, it's not that exciting of a question. Um, the whole point is that prostaglandins just have so many biological effects, so many um, antagonistic effects between different prostaglandins. I figured that you would be able to, you know, figure this one out pretty quickly. It says, what response is caused by prostaglandins produced in the kidneys? Well, it says stimulation of ovulation, smooth muscle contraction. Which one of these do you think looks the most reasonable? I think it's probably C, which deals with renal blood vessels, right? Because renal is related to what? Related to the kidneys, okay? In French, kidney is rein, so it's easy to remember, not that you need a French lesson or anything. Okay, number three says, which of the following statements concerning lipid functions is not true? Who could help me out with number three? Who's with me? Number three, there's one of these, sir. Uh, Tell me what the answer to three is, to number three. Well, if you're unsure, we could read through them all. It says in A, the human body uses triglycerides for long-term storage, insulation, and protection. That's absolutely true. Plants and animals use waxes as water barriers. If you've ever looked at um, or if you've ever heard the expression like water off a duck's back, Right, it's wax on their feathers that enables water to, to um, you know, uh, to roll off of their feathers. I guess, for lack of a better word. And if you think about pl um, plant leaves, like on a lot of trees, um, they have um, sort of a waxy coating on them. Um, the next one says phosphoglycerides are key components of of the structure of cell membranes. Well, that's true because a phosphoglyceride is a phospholipid. Right? And phospholipids are a big part of cell membranes. Steroids function as messenger molecules that enable cell, cell communication. That's absolutely true. And the, so that means that e, the answer is E. All of the statements uh, concerning lipid functions are true. Do you guys want to take a quick break? I would like to take a five-minute break and then come back. So let me see here. Stop. Okay, Jasmine says yes. When Jasmine speaks, I listen. Okay.
All right. So I'm just going to turn my mic off. I'm just actually really going to go get a drink of water. Why don't we come back in like five, six or seven minutes? Sound good?
Oakley Doakley. Let's get back to it. So we're on question number four right now. Question number four. Oops, cancel. Question number four says, hold on, let me double check my teams here. Okay, everything's good. Question number four says, cetyl palmitate. Cetyl palmitate is a component of spermaceti wax isolated from the heads of sperm whales and is used in cosmetics. In which solvent would cetyl palmitate be expected to have the greatest solubility? Now, keep in mind that they've condensed part of the structure here, right? It says CH2, but there's 15 of those. And then there's 14 of these. So if we were to write out the bond line structure, right, we would have our ester group. We have a total of 15 carbons over here. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 on this side. And on the other side, we have 16. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. And so this is the structure of cetyl, cetyl palmitate. Okay, when I look at the entire thing, oops. Mm, let me see here, Tyler. Let's see what the problem is. It's probably on my end. Yeah, it was. Mm -hmm. Here you go. So I've gone ahead and I've drawn out the entire bond line structure of cetyl palmitate right here. Okay, so the question, all the question is asking is if you look at the structure of cetyl palmitate, which one of these solvents would you expect it to dissolve, the, dissolve in? Acetic acid, ethyl alcohol or ethanol, petroleum ether, which actually is a mixture of liquid alkanes, water, or 5% sodium chloride? Who do you, or which one of these do you think is the best answer? Which one of these do you think would be the best answer? Maybe I could ask the question a different way. Is cetyl palmitate, does it look like a polar or a nonpolar molecule to you? Would cetyl palmitate be polar or nonpolar? I would say it's definitely nonpolar, right? The only thing in here that's polar is this little tiny carbon oxygen bonds. All of this and all of that, that's all nonpolar. So cetyl palmitate is, in fact, a very, it is a nonpolar molecule. Non, very nonpolar. Okay, well, it is a wax, right? Waxes are nonpolar. You take a wax, candle wax, that's a wax. It doesn't, it floats on water, right? It is not mixable with water because waxes are very nonpolar. So which one of these solvents would it dissolve in? Well, acetic acid is a small carboxylic acid. That's super polar, as is ethyl alcohol. But petroleum ether, it says it's actually a mixture of liquid, what? Alkanes. Alkanes are also nonpolar. And so cetyl palmitate is going to best dissolve in a mixture of liquid alkanes. All right. Number five says, which class of human lipoproteins carries triglycerides after you, you, know, you eat a fatty meal, takes triglycerides from the intestine to other tissue? This is one that would involve a little bit of memorization. So I'm just going to move on with it and tell you that the answer is the chylomicron. Okay, it's the least dense of all the plasma lipoproteins, and it is involved in carrying triglycerides from the intestines to other tissues. Number six says testosterone, cholesterol, and progesterone are all classified as steroids. They're all classified as steroids because they contain the steroid nucleus. Which of the following compounds would be classified as a steroid? Let me help you out with this one. The steroid nucleus has the ABCD ring system, and the ABCD ring system always looks like this. A, B, C, and D with a five-membered ring here. It's always this, A, B, C, D. Based off of that, this is the steroid nucleus, okay? Right here, you can clearly see 
that one has the A, B, C, D ring structure. B has four rings, but they are not arranged in the same pattern as they are in that box, okay? Neither in uh, compound three. So the answer is one only. Look, we have a six-membered ring. Even though it's aromatic, we have another six-membered ring. We have a six-membered ring up and to the right, and then we have a five-membered ring off of it like that, okay? And so one would be considered a steroid. Number seven, there's a long answer for this one. It says, a tube of lipstick lists, lists capric, capric triglyceride among its ingredients. Capric triglyceride is a simple triglyceride containing capric acid, which is a 10 carbon saturated fatty acid, right? So if I want to draw out the structure of capric acid, it's a fatty acid. So I have my, let me fix that up. I have my carboxyl group and I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So that's the fatty acid and it's going to be a triglyceride, right? And triglycerides are made from glycerol and fatty acid. And so which one of these structures has glycerol as a backbone like this? Okay, that's a glycerol backbone plus a 10 carbon, a 10 carbon saturated fatty acid. Could anybody tell me which one of these looks like the best answer? A, B, C, D, or E? All right, so what I'm going to end up doing is I'm going to end up reacting glycerol. So glycerol, I'll draw the structure of glycerol. It's a triol. This is glycerol, okay? And I'm going to react it with three molecules of capric acid. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And let's make another one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, like that. Right, I'm going to add all three of those. Okay, so I'm going to end up with my glycerol backbone, and then I'm going to have three esters, right? Three esters. Okay, and of course, I'm going to also have three water mo molecules that are given off, right? But how many carbons are going to be here in the R group? Well, I have one here in all of the carbonyls, so that means I'm going to have a total of nine. If you look at this one here, it says I've got nine plus one, that's 10, so that's too many. If you look at B, I have eight here, and then I have one in the methyl group, and I have one in the carbonyl, that's a total of 10. So the answer is B. Let's move on to number eight. Number eight says palmitic acid, a 16 carbon saturated fatty acid, can practice drawing our fatty acid. So palmitic acid, we have one carbon on the carbonyl, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. It's a 16 carbon fatty acid, and I'm reacting it with a 30 carbon unbranched alcohol. So a 30 carbon unbranched alcohol, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. I'm reacting these two molecules to make a wax, right? I'm trying to make a wax from these, so I'm adding these two together. And what is a wax? A wax is an ester. The only difference between an ester and a wax is that the hydrocarbon chains are really, really long. Okay, so if I look at these, I'm going to have 16 carbons from the carboxyl side, and I'm going to have 30 carbons from the alcohol side. So it's just a matter of looking at each one of these and seeing which one is an ester and which one has 30 carbons on the, um, on the uh, right and which one has 16 carbons on the left. Okay, so if I look at A, I have one plus 15 plus one, that's 17 carbons on the left. That can't be right. If I look at B, I see my ester is in the wrong position. The oxygen should be over here. So B cannot be the correct answer. If I look at C, 
I have a total of one plus 16 plus one, that's 17. And I'm looking for a 16 carbon um, saturated fatty acid. Here I have one plus 14 plus one, that's 16 carbons on this side. Here I have 29 plus one, that's a total of 30. D is the correct answer because my ester is in the correct place. E is, can't be the correct answer because this is a ketone, it's not even an ester. And so the correct answer is D. Moving right along. Number nine, sphingomyelins are a type of sphingolipid, cell membrane lipids that contain sphingosine, an 18 carbon amino alcohol, as the backbone of the structure. What type of bond joins the fatty acid portion of the sphingomyelin molecule to the sphingosine backbone? There's only one part of this molecule that has a, a portion that could have come from a fatty acid. Who could tell me how many carbons are in um, that fatty acid portion? Or sorry, what type of bond joins the fatty acid portion? Not a trick question. What's a fatty acid, okay? Somebody says a carbon-carbon double bond. No, the fatty acid portion, right? What's a fatty acid? It's a carboxylic acid with a long tail on the end, okay? An unsaturated fatty acid, okay, had, might have a double bond in it, right? But we need to have, how would we bind it, right? The fatty acid is always going to have the carbonyl left over. There's only one place here where we have, where we have a carbonyl in our molecule. Right, where's the only place that we have a carbonyl? Right here. Okay, and how is that fatty acid portion joined to the backbone of the sphingosine? It's joined right here through an amide bond. So the answer is through an amide bond. Um, number 10 says tristerin has a melting point of 72 degrees Celsius. Would it be a fat or an oil if it doesn't melt until 72 degrees Celsius? If it doesn't melt until 72 degrees Celsius, is it a fat or an oil? Yes, it would be a fat because oils are liquids, liquids at room temperature, and fats are solid at room temperature. And room temperature is like 25 degrees Celsius, right? So this won't melt at 25 degrees Celsius, it doesn't melt until 72. So the answer is, it is a fat. Um, this one, it just involves the hydrolysis of a triglyceride. It's kind of long, but basically it's saying, if you were to hydrolyze this with aqueous sodium hydroxide, what would you get? Well, you'd end up blowing all of these ester bonds, right? You're hydrolyzing an ester. So let me erase this and what else there. So you would break this bond, this bond, this bond. Okay, and you would end up with you'd end up with this molecule, which is glycerol, glycerol, and you would end up with the fatty acid of this, of this, and of this. I don't really feel like drawing all of them out, but we can. Um, and of course, you would end up with the carboxylate salt because you are in base. Remember, in base, we don't make an acid. When we hydrolyze in base, we make a carboxylate. So we have the sodium carboxylate. And the top two both have a total of 12 carbons, I think. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Yeah, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Did I put 13? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Anyhow, and you would get two of those. And then you would get one of these guys, one of these carboxylates where you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Then you have a double bond. Okay. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, something like that. Anyhow, and then you would have the sodium salt of it like that. All right. So that's what you would get if you did saponification on that triglyceride. 
Number 12, I would never ask this one. So let's scratch that one for now. Um, also, so let's look at number 13. It says that octanol is more efficient than hexanol at crossing a cell membrane and entering a cell. Well, octanol is a, a bigger compound, right? Octanol is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this is octanol, octanol. And hexanol has one, two, three, four, five, six. So hexanol. Okay, well, um, octanol it has a larger, larger hydrophobic tail than hexanol. And therefore, it would be more efficient at crossing the nonpolar environment of the cell membrane. So we could write that down. Octanol, octanol has a larger hydrophobic tail um, and is therefore more efficient at crossing at crossing the nonpolar environment environment of the cell membrane right which um yeah there we go Good. Would you expect glycerol to readily cross the cell membrane? Yes or no? You could answer that for me. Should glycerol readily cross a cell membrane? No, it's too polar, exactly. I'd put no. Glycerol has three OH groups and no hydrophobic tail. There you go. Number 15, classify each prostaglandin according to the patterns on your slides. I would never ask you to do that on an exam. You, if you look, if you look them up, you would see that this one is PG. E1 because it only has one double bond, right? And this one is PG, PGF1. Again, I would never ask you to do that. And I would never ask you question 16. I actually took that out of an organic two um, from UCCS. I took it out of a book from organic two. So I would never ask that question either on, um, on one of your tests or exams. And there we have it. All right, that brings us to 620. I think that's enough review for this evening. Why don't we meet in the lab at 8 p.m.? I'll be there a little bit early. And we will do the saponification lab. And if you have any questions about this, you can ask me. I will also post, besides the video, I'll post the PDF of everything that I just wrote to, um, to D2L so that you can take a look at that as well. Okay, so I'll see you all in one hour and 39 minutes.